from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So, uh, this hour we're going to talk about the Japanese-American experience in World War II. We have a, uh, a great panel of, uh, of veterans to talk with you. Uh, we also have a, a gentleman here who you might guess is not a Japanese-American, but he has a great story about them. So, he'll also contribute. We're going to let each of them take a little time, introduce themselves, and uh, then we're going to have uh, Marty's story. Then we'll open it up for your questions. So we'll go in that order. My name is uh, Frank Sogi. I come from uh, Kona, Hawaii, on the big island of Hawaii, uh, the location where the only coffee is grown in the United States and it is a gourmet coffee. So if you ever see Kona coffee, please buy and drink it. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's my speech. <laughs> now, when the war started on December 7, 1941, I was uh, a freshman at the University of Hawaii and as required, I was uh, taking a reserve officer's training uh, course. After one semester of that, I was a seasoned soldier. So on that day, all ROTC students were called in and activated. From December 7 to about February 1942, for about three months, we guarded uh, electric plants, water facilities, and so forth. But the United States government saw that we all looked like the enemy, so we were summarily discharged from the Army. I went back, oh, those on the West Coast, and the other speakers may talk about this, they were not as fortunate. We were not incarcerated in the American concentration camp, but the Japanese Americans on the West Coast were incarcerated in the uh, American concentration camps for the duration of the war. In 1944, or by 1944 early, we knew that we were going to win the war. And the government saw that there was need for linguists, people who could speak Japanese. So we volunteered. I had uh, four sons in my family, and three of us volunteered. My brother, oldest brother, and I volunteered for military intelligence service. And my second brother volunteered for the 442nd and went to Europe with that unit. In uh, January or February 1944, I volunteered for the Military Intelligence Service, and I was sent to Camp Savage and Fort Snelling in Minnesota. And then I did not go overseas like my brother who went overseas, I have not had any military battle experience. I was teaching the language in Minnesota. My brother, uh, unfortunately, died in Okinawa two days before the war ended on August 13, 1945. After the war ended, I wanted to see my relatives in Japan and to see how they were doing, how they were faring. So I volunteered for one year service in the counterintelligence corps in Sapporo, Hokkaido, where we did continuous uh, interrogation of military personnel, Japanese military personnel, returning from Russian territory like Manchuria, Vladivostok, and an island in the northern part of Hokkaido called Saghalin. And during my one year in Hokkaido with the military intelligence, uh, counterintelligence corps, 
we learned and we discovered two teams of uh, espionage agents that the Russians sent into Hokkaido. We compromised them and uh, used them by sending messages that we drafted and they sent by Morse code. In that tour of duty in Japan for one year, I learned when I visited my parents' uh, prefecture in southern Japan that my mother, who had seven sisters and two brothers, and in Japan, the large family was very common in those days. The youngest brother of my uncle was the Navy uh, p fighter pilot. And I learned that he was one of the pilots who attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. And he returned successfully to Japan after the attack and uh, received some imperial medals, which I saw. On the second mission, in the Battle of Midway, on June 6, 1942, uh, the Battle of Midway happened and he was killed in that battle. As you may, some of you know, by June of 1942, we had broken the Japanese code, so we knew exactly what their battle plans were. Their plan was to bomb the hell out of uh, Midway and land their troops, but Admiral Halsey, I think, or Nimitz, I forget which, had the information of their plans, so we attacked them first, and that's when my uncle was killed. So in the occupation one year, it was uh, quite an experience, and I must say, my experience in the Army was one of the best experiences I've had. I learned a great deal and matured very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> My name is Warren Tsuneishi. I was born on July 4, 1921, in Monrovia, California. My father named me after the then President Warren G. Harding, possibly the worst president this country has ever had the misfortune to have, but please don't judge me by his behavior. I will be celebrating with my family and friends my 83rd birthday on July 4th of this year, about five weeks from now. <laughs> and I will be called upon to sing, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, born on the 4th of July. But I would hesitate to do that for you here today because my age-related hearing loss has made my singing voice less than that of, let's say, an American idol. So despite my good looks, I would never win that contest. I was educated in the schools of California, had all kinds of friends from all over, from all racial groups. I was in the Boy Scouts, and you know, the Boy Scout code is on my honor. I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country. And my country was the United States of America. You know the West Point code, duty, honor, country. People ask me why I volunteered for the U.S. Army when after Pearl Harbor, my family and I had been put into these detention centers. Now, Pearl Harbor was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. I thought my life was coming to an end. People asked me why I volunteered. I said, this is my country. I have to fight for it. That was the feeling in those days. Anyone of draft age, when war came, they willingly went into the service. I was no different from most Americans of that, males of that time. I went into those detention camps with my family. 
event. My family consisted of uh, nine siblings. Four of us of draft age eventually wound up in the U.S. Army. All of us in the military intelligence service because we had some Japanese language capability. There's a very well-known photograph of my mother in that relocation center in Heart Mountain holding a small binaret with four blue stars, denoting that she had sent four of her sons into the service. I went, like Frank Sogi, through the Military Intelligence Service Language School, six months period of training, and then was sent overseas to Hawaii, where we, I joined the 24th Corps. 24th Corps is a very large organization, and 10 of us Japanese Americans were assigned to it as the 306 Headquarters Intelligence Detachment for our expertise in the Japanese language. The War Department and the Navy Department knew that if war ever came between the United States and Japan, they would need people competent in the languages, in the language of, uh, in, ja in the Japanese language. I wish that they had heeded that same knowledge before they went into Iraq with an inadequate supply of Arabic speaking soldiers, but that was our job, to interrogate prisoners of war, and we were taught that you do not humiliate, you do not abuse prisoners of war. There is such a thing as the Geneva Conventions. And we, we found that if you treated these captured soldiers, and despite their reputation to fight to the bitter end, quite a few of them surrendered or were captured, we found that if you treated them with some kindness and with some respect, they would say, tell us anything that we needed to know. What was their unit? How were they trained? What were they trained for? What was their equipment? What kind of ammunition and fuel artillery and guns and machine guns they had? What was their mission in, uh, in the, on the battlefield? This kind of information is of the greatest importance. Technically, it's called order of battle information. And that was our major contribution, I would say, to the winning of the war against Japan. My job especially was to translate captured enemy documents, Japanese language documents. And the Japanese military was very ca careless with this documents, even top secret battlefield orders and, and uh, battlefield strategy documents because I believe they felt that there was nobody in the U.S. Army who could read and translate those documents. But that was our job to do that. I was never in the front lines. I was at, always at Corps headquarters, but I did volunteer once for a uh, reinforced battalion to go into the uh, island in the Philippines. You will remember that when, in the initial phases of the war, uh, we were in the Philippines, of course, the U.S. Army was defeated and General MacArthur, the commanding officer, had to retreat to Australia where he mounted a counter-offensive. He was to mount a counter-offensive. And he vowed that he should, re I shall return he returned on October 20, 1944, and I was with that army organization that returned. After, uh, uh, the Battle of Leyte was relatively short, and by Christmas of that year, the island was declared secure, but MacArthur's headquarters received a, an urgent call from a small group of islands called the Sweet Potato Islands, in Spanish, the Camotes Islands, that they were being massacred by the Japanese troops in, still in command in that area. They asked for a reinforced battalion of about 800 men to be sent in to liberate the Camotes. And two of us, Japanese Americans, a man named Lloyd Shinsato from Honolulu, and I volunteered for that um, 
uh, liberation uh, battle. That was the first time I came under direct enemy fire. But most of the time I was safe in the rear echelon with the air, with echelon troops. I was also, after that, involved with our outfit in the Battle of Okinawa, the bloodiest single battle in the whole Pacific War. That was, a, as you know, the last battle. That was when Japan surrendered after the bomb, a dropping of the atom bombs. Um, so after that, our outfit was sent into the occupation of Korea. And after that, um, they offered to uh, grant me a field commission as a second lieutenant. And I said, no, thank you. I've had enough of war. I, I want to go back home. And I did. And the government had a wonderfully generous um, plan called the um, GI Bill of Rights, under which it paid for my college education. I had been a junior at the University of California when Pearl Harbor was attacked. I had one more year to go, and I was able to get out of camp to finish that. But I wanted to do some graduate work. And that was, as far as I was concerned, the greatest uh, investment that the United States and the taxpayers of the United States made in educating its citizen soldiers. It was because of the graduate school education that I was able to get that I was able to obtain some fairly good positions. I ended up at the Library of Congress right down the road as chief of the Asian division. And I thank God Almighty that I was a citizen of the United States and that those, these opportunities had come to me so that I could reach the status that I finally reached. I've been retired for now a little bit over 11 years and uh, I spend most of my time uh, working with the Japanese American Veterans Association. We have a booth down the road and in the Veterans Affairs uh, Services tent and I urge you to visit it. You will get a warm welcome from them. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is Jim Kanaya from Clackamas, Oregon. Uh, are there any Oregonians out there from Oregon? Anybody from Oregon? Hey, welcome, welcome to Washington, D.C. Do you know that there's only one state in the Union named after an Irishman, Oregon? Well, that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> anyway, I joined the Army before the war started. Uh, I felt that my destiny was in the military at a very young age. I used to watch all the parades and the National Guard uh, encampments. And so I found myself trying to enlist uh, in some branch of the service. Well, I went to the Marines. This was 1940. I went to the Marines, and they didn't even look at me. No, we don't. I went downstairs to the Navy. No, uh, they came and looked at me, and they wouldn't even say uh, welcome or nothing. So I said, they, the Navy guy says, why don't you go to the Army? They're taking anybody in the Army. So sure enough, I went to the Army. And you know, even though I was uh, over 18, they wanted me to have a complete physical. When they were taking guys with only one hand, practically, they were drafting men with, uh, who could walk and talk and they were in service a year. I had to go through a real a long process of physicals. In fact, I had a couple of bad teeth. They had to have them either pulled or filled or bridge put in or something. It took me about two months. And I was knocking on the door trying to get in. And finally, I, I made it. But anyway, that was the days of $21 a month. $21 a month. Buck Private had $21 a month for three months. At the end of the third month, he drew $30 a month. And then if he made PFC, one strike, he got $36 a month. Well, lo and behold, I found myself in the Army Medical Department not having one day of medical training. And, uh, well, I just learned everything by on-the-job training, how to take care of patients in a hospital. And I had a very fine mentor, a, a lady nurse, a Miss Higgins. She taught me everything I, I should know in the ward and how to handle the ward patients. 
how to carry bedpans and urinals without spilling them, and, and how to feed patients who couldn't be fed by themselves. And it was great. It's like I get, kept getting promoted. And uh, at one point, as a private first class, I was drawing one dollar a month more than a buck sergeant, a three-striper, because I had a specialist rating, a first and class and second class specialist rating. That paid $61 a month. I drew that for one month. And lo and behold, they promoted me to corporal, and I lost $7 a month. Down, I was back down to 50, $54 a month. Now, I really don't know if anybody can take a promotion to get make less money, but uh, that happened in those days, and I'm sure it doesn't happen now. But uh, December 7th, 1941, I was stationed in Santa Barbara, California, at the General Hospital, and uh, you know, back in those days on the West Coast, Japanese uh, Americans uh, could not swim in public pools unless you're accepted at an hour when there are very few people there. So what I did was every Sunday morning, you know, I, by the way, we got just one day off. And back in those days, we worked seven to seven, six days a week, and every Sunday we got one day off. I'd go, I would go to the YMCA in Santa Barbara and go swimming. Nobody's there. Everybody's supposed to be at church anyway, so we, as I was coming out, there was a man standing at the counter on December 7th. It was about, uh, what time was it? Uh, seven, uh, it would be about what, 10 o'clock? Some, something like that. He looked down at me and said, hey, you guys here already? He said, you guys here already? Looking at me and says, he said, what the, what's he talking about? But he said, listen, the clerk behind the counter well, had a radio, and he, he had his ear tuned to the radio, the description of the bombing of the Pearl Harbor. And boy, I tell you, when I heard that, I shagged back to the hospital. And of course, from that point on, the details are kind of fuzzy. But the hospital personnel, the, the uh, command and all the nurses, still treated us as if nothing happened. And I think that is a great credit, you know, to the Army, well, Army Medical Department, anybody from medics out there. I think they did a great job at that moment. And as we were rounded up about a month later, uh, a couple of months later, to be evacuated inland ahead of our civilian Japanese Americans, the commanding officer of the hospital came down and gave us a pep talk, you know? He didn't have to do that. He could have said, we're glad to get rid of you. But he appreciated what we did. We were about, there was about 25 of us, Japanese Americans at this hospital of about, oh, maybe 300 total number of troops. And he gave us a pep talk. He said, you guys did a good job. Keep it up. You're gonna make it. You're gonna come back and congratulations. And I, I felt that rather odd, you know. If I was in the infantry, they would, they took, they got their rifles taken away and they were put in confinement in some cases secured so that they wouldn't go off base or start a riot or something. And they, they somewhat distrusted in a sense. But anyway, I stayed in the medics and I joined the 442nd Infantry, went overseas and, and then I got captured and I came back and then out of a one year overseas, I spent six months uh, in combat and six months in, in captivity, but uh, always as a medic and as a medic, I got a little special treatment, by the way. Some of you may not realize it, but if you're a medical personnel, we are considered protected personnel by the Red Cross, by the Geneva Convention. And we are given a little extra privileges. Instead of one letter a week in prison camp, we could write two letters a week. And we were supposed to be given some kind of a walking freedom about once every two weeks. All the medics could go out the gate with a guard and go walk around the country. And of course, when we did that in the middle of the winter, why, we would run into the potato patches and pick up little potatoes. That the, that the, uh, we were in Poland, by the way, in Poland. Pick up little tiny potatoes and bring them back in the pocket. And we'd give it to all the other uh, prisoners. We called each other Kriegis. Kriegis, uh, Kriegis Gefangenen means uh, Krieg is war, Gefangenen prison. We were called Kriegis. The rest of us Kriegis, would, I, I would share these potatoes with them. Well, we had no way of cooking the potatoes. Where are you gonna get the wood and fire and stove? So we eat them raw. Have you ever eaten raw potatoes? You know what happens there, don't you? <laughs> well, that, that didn't go over very good. 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, we came, I came back, and, um, and by that time, my parents are relocated back uh, uh, into the Chicago area, and they stayed there, and um, in fact, I'm going to say something about that evacuation. Movement of 120,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast to inland. Anywhere from Idaho, Montana, uh, they even had two camps in Arkansas, by the way. And uh, to me, I think they had some kind of an advantage. It was an advantage to that because my parents were farmers, they worked seven days a week, sun up to sundown, and they were 55, 40, 55, 66 years of age. And they were kind of pooped out by that time, 30 years of uh, farming in, uh, uh, in Oregon. So this was, I think, kind of a rest, it was a kind of a restful break for them, you might, might say. But at the same time, as you can probably realize, among the Japanese families in the, in the West Coast, the father, the father of the family rules the roost. He's the king. But once they were incarcerated, all that leadership of the family was broken up. The father had no more responsibilities for his family. They were being fed, and they, if they worked, they got $9 a month. And so father was lost complete control of his family. But yet, the kids stayed together. And I think that was uh, one principle that was inherited by the ancestors for being what they call the filial piety, be loyal to your parents, whatever the consequences. Well, I'm going to give you one example of what happened before, the, before we went overseas. I was a first sergeant, and uh, I had five stripes as an acting first sergeant. And in order to visit my parents in, in the camp, a relocation center, it had barbed wire fences all around it, had watchtowers on every corner, machine guns pointed at them uh, if they tried to escape in the typical stockade atmosphere. I had to get permission from a private to open the gate for me so I could go in and visit my parents. I had to show my furlough papers, you know. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but now I think, uh, why, did he, why did I have to go through that? And I had to set my bag on the table and take out, make sure I didn't bring any whiskey or booze or guns or knives in the camp, you know. But another funny thing happened, in camp, I had uh, quite a few friends from Portland area in camp, but you know, none of them came from it. They made me, I put in, as I said, 33 years, and I got the benefit of all the advantages, and they put me through all the schools. They tried to teach me something that even if I didn't want to be taught. <laughs> Are you telling me I said, I'm talking too much? <laughs> no, I, once just I no get carried away, you know, I have a hard time stopping because I, Really, I've never talked to people before about this. Just the last couple of years, I've been working with high school students on history classes about World War II. And I've talked to Army troops in Fort Lewis, Washington, and Fort Sam Houston, Texas, at the graduating classes about the medical aspects of uh, World War II and the career in the military. And I'm kind of a wandering recruiter, you know, you might say. And uh, I don't get paid for it either, by the way. It's just all voluntary, and of course, I take it off of my income taxes, but I enjoy it. And I want to thank you all for being here, and I appreciate your interest in what we are doing here. Thank you. And now, Marty has uh, a story that he would like to tell, and, uh, and it's about him and a group of men that he was with in combat, and, uh, and they owe a debt of gratitude to the Japanese Americans. I'm, I'm 88 years old, and this is the first time I show, ever showed prejudice. These guys got 10 minutes, I'm getting five. I went through the National Guard Horse Cavalry, and we were called up to active duty. I won't go through all of that. But basically, I was a horse cavalry man. We volunteered for the infantry, and I won't go through that. I eventually became a company commander. And being a company commander is an awesome responsibility. You're responsible for all these young men. 
I prayed every night I would never get caught in an ambush. I could never live through it. Now on the capture story, we all resented being called the Lost Battalion. The Lost Battalion, we, well, actually the division had grid coordinates. Uh, we knew where we were and the Germans knew where we were. And Lost sounds you're roaming around the forest looking for some place out. But since then, actually we were trapped. We were going in, my company was spearheading the battalion. And we were, being, we were attacking on the front, and we were being attacked on the right and the left flank. I told Lieutenant Burr very emphatically, we're going to get cut off. And he said, press on, there'll be troops behind you. And he went back to look for the troops behind us. And there weren't any. Well, the Germans closed the gate, and we were trapped. We had expended so much ammunition fighting our way through that there was no way we could start attacking back. So we had no choice but to, was to oh, by the way, I suddenly went from a company commander to a battalion commander. Now, if it's tremendous for a company commander, it's awesome for a battalion commander. I never got paid for that week, but that's another point. What we had to do was establish a strong defensive position, which we did. They were sending food into us by shells, D-bars, halazone tablets. If you don't know what that is, to purify water. They were trying to dive bomb food into us for five days. On the fifth day, they succeeded. And in, the, in, those, be in those belly tanks, we had ammunition, more food, and more medical supplies. We had so much ammunition, we could arrange for 50 men. Well, not, not actually not 50. We asked for volunteers to go on a combat patrol to try to break through. And 50 men volunteered, no coercion. And they went out, and only five came back. Somewhere they were ambushed. We never knew what, found, what we found out about it. Well, I've been asked the most uh, serious point of this uh, reason for my being here. What was my feeling when the Japanese Americans broke through? Well, I was told meant by many people, I was asked by many people, Japanese Americans, what did I think of these little guys coming through? I swear to God, they looked like giants to us. We knew their combat record in Italy. Some of my non-coms were in the hospitals with the, with the 400th or the 100th battalion that were wounded. Now, when they finally broke through, the war was not over. I would like to say I acted with joy. I did it. I still had that awesome responsibility to get my men out, to get security posted by the Japanese Americans at 442nd. And actually, I have gotten to know, well, I'll go back a few years. In 1948, Mike Masayoka came out when I was in Chicago. And the, their parents had a citizenship bill up pending. And he asked me to write to every Democrat or, or congressman controlling the bill, which I did. Mike never mentioned the casualties. He just said his brother died in that operation. We never knew until 1997. Oh, I, I should back up a little bit. All the news clippings got after the lost, the lost battalion, I'm saying it too. They never mentioned the 442nd. They referred to them as soldiers. I think the U.S. government deliberately censored them out because they had an egg on their face and they had to eat crow. They could not admit that these men who came from parents whose farms were confiscated, homes confiscated, business confiscated, and they were incarcerated in the term of camps, could be so brave. Now, there was some question about General Dork was using these men to save Texans. When I joined the Texan division, my platoon sergeant was Texan and had my platoon. By the time we were cut off, there wasn't a Texan left in the outfit. Now, General Dork was used these men because they were one of the finest fighting machines in Europe. It also would have been a disgrace if you lost a battalion. I pledge my honor and heart to these men. We owe them, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. I love them. Thank you.
so remember that as we turn some time over to you for questions that these these men and those like them fought not just racism but having their families in prison unjustly without any cause and they still volunteered and still fought for their country and now we have to uh, excuse Jimmy he has another appointment so we'll turn the rest of the time though over to you for questions uh, answered by the other two gentlemen So, are there any questions out there? May I, may I say, uh, I would like to add that uh, the occupation of uh, Japan, I feel, was uh, very, very successful because of the fact that our military had the language ability. We knew the custom of Japan and also we knew the Japanese and uh, many of the military intelligence service personnel in the occupation of Japan did a great deal far beyond their official duties. For example, while I was in Hokkaido, I uh, collected my candy rations and cigarettes ration, which I didn't smoke, I sold and saved the money and gave a Christmas party for a Catholic uh, uh, orphanage in Hokkaido. There were others in other parts of Japan who got together and planted, for example, cherry trees in devastated condition in Japan, which wel they were welcomed by the Japanese because, as you know, cherry trees are very uh, valuable in Japan. And also, because of uh, the success in Japan and the de democratization of the country, I think we should have learned a lesson when we went into Iraq. New York Times reported several weeks ago that they were having a great difficulty in the occupation of Iraq because of the lack of language ability, let alone not knowing the culture of Iraq. There is an inscription on the archives building here in Washington that says, that reads, what is past is prologue. And a cab driver was taking an out of town passenger and the passenger said, uh, driver, what does that mean? What is past? is prologue. He says it means you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, we actually have a question. Hello, gentlemen. I'm uh, Colin Heaton, and I had the great privilege of interviewing Daniel Inouye. And, uh, and I know your unit history very well. I want to say one thing, then a question. I don't know if many people here know that your unit, man for man, had the highest ratio of medals of honor, silver stars, bronze stars, and purple hearts of any unit in U.S. combat history. Uh, and that General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring put a bounty on the head of your commanding officer, whom he thought was Japanese, of 100,000 Reichsmarks. So you guys were basically stalked by three SS divisions, two German parachute divisions, and a Panzer Grenadier Battalion because they saw you as the greatest threat. That's just so you know that. That's how much your enemy thought of you. My question is, do you feel that the Reagan Act that gave uh, remuneration for the incarcerations was adequate? And do you feel that this uh, World War II memorial dedication is a good way to heal some of those wounds as well? I'll try to respond to part that partly. I don't think the monetary remuneration will ever undo the damage that was done. Um, th the thing is, what I remember most and cherish most was a letter I received from President Bush Sr. in which he says that the U.S. government has is apologizes for what happened to us during during the war. 
I think that is a lesson that the American people have learned um, through the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s, that uh, this country is made up of people from all over the world, and that if you diminish one group, you diminish the whole of this country. I think, th I think that it is time, so over 200 years after the Declaration of Independence, the American people live up to the values of these words in that document that is basic to our country. The ideals that are embodied in the Bill of Rights, the Fifth, Special, the Fifth Amendment, that you shall, cannot be arrested, imprisoned without due process of law. I hope and pray that the Arab American people in this country today, those of the Muslim faith, will be given the complete protection of the Constitution of the United States and that we all of us as Americans live up to the fundamental values of the, what makes America great and what makes America the ideal to be followed by people all over the world. I have a very short comment. I think it's 20 years too late. Any other questions? You are, you are asking me to sing the Yankee Doodle Dandy? Did I hear you correctly? Oh, I, um, I went in the government in uh, 1943 making maps uh, for the United States government here in Washington. Well, I was also in high school during the time when they had the, when you were put in those uh, prison places. And we were told that the reason was that the American did not know the Japanese language, so they didn't know what these people were talking about at all. I mean, you said that yourself, that you were used in the military because there wasn't hardly anybody that knew the Japanese language. Now, as I understand, they were not conscripted in Hawaii because Hawaii was not a state, and that makes it very interesting and probably very hard for you to stomach also because uh, that was, as I understand, the Japanese in Hawaii were not conscripted. Uh, yes, there was some talk of uh, evacuating the uh, Japanese in Hawaii. I was born and raised in Hawaii, but the relationship between the military and the uh, Japanese citizenry uh, was very, very good, and they understood the community. They did not understand the language, as your question indicates, but there was not a problem for them. They knew that the Japanese could be trusted. As I mentioned earlier, I was conscripted in the Army on December 7 and kicked out two or three months later because we looked like the, the enemy. But this was the decision that was made in Washington and not what made in Hawaii by the military. My, uh, my under understanding and research, by the way, suggests that they didn't do that to the Japanese Americans in Hawaii because the economy would have fallen completely apart. Maybe that's part of the reason. Another question. Is uh, Jim, is that your name, J James? Lost Battalion? Marty? Well, I was there, Marty. Uh, I'm half Japanese. And uh, I was in the artillery part of the 442nd. And uh, I saw the Messerschmitts flying by. And we fired 
uh, artillery into the area and so on. So I know all about your lost battalion and how you felt when you came out. I can't exactly hear you there, Jim. Marty. Yeah, we did, and uh, I understand that one time, one of the uh, one of the canisters fell on one of you guys' heads. That's how accurate they were. Was it your artillery outfit sending in the D bars and the halazone tablets? Yep. Chewing, yep. chewing tobacco with yep. cigarettes. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. My son has a picture uh, that was in the New York Times of showing those uh, uh, shells being loaded. He's sitting over here. Uh, some, or did he just, no, he's sitting over here, and, and if you'd be interested, he it was in New York Times. We well, didn't have a man hurt with those shells. You, we, your, grid, uh, your grid coordinates were great. We were uh, at the ceremony about oh, four or five months ago to the dedication of the uh, monument here on the Japanese Americans, and uh, Bob Dole was our spokesman there, and he said that you guys we, we lost, going in after you, we lost 800 people, and you, we saved 211 of you people. And uh, I said, well, I said, uh, you know, the Pentagon had studied this, and they, uh, they said that was uh, not a good uh, um, army decision. However, I said, well, you'd have to talk to the 211 men that came out from the lost battalion, and uh, they'll say that, uh, that it was a good decision. Well, if you mention 800 casualties, I have documents. The 800 casualties were for the month of October. It included Briere Bifontaine. I got this from the data manager, Jimmy Yamashita. There were 74 men killed uh, liberating Briere and 54 men uh, rescuing us. Oh. And some of the colonists have been uh, scattering that. Uh, I read one place where the, they said that there were 800 killed in our rescue. Yeah. And that's when I got in touch with Andy Ono in Hawaii and Jimmy Amishita, and it's been documented. If I heard it, okay? okay. Thank you. And if you're interested in the Lost Battalion, he'll be happy to talk to you about it. We weren't, we weren't lost. Hello, gentlemen. Um, I know uh, you were you were talking earlier, but you were both in MIS in the Pacific, and uh, you were. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, the Japanese forces were absolutely fierce uh, opponents, um, and my question is, uh, well, I guess to give an example of that, uh, you, you mentioned Okinawa. Uh, I believe we lost. 12,000 sailors, marines, and uh, soldiers, and the, the Japanese uh, forces lost 120,000. I wanted to know how many actually uh, uh, surrendered, because I know they, the Japanese forces did, did not surrender very easy, and I wanted to know how many, uh, how many of the Japanese uh, soldiers actually surrendered, and uh, was it hard to get information out of them? Thank you. Um, I don't have any figures on, on that issue. However, the entire Japanese nation surrendered after the dropping of the atom bomb. They had this, they were indoctrinated in this death before dishonor business. To die for the emperor of Japan was the most glorious thing they could do. Above all, they should never be captured. That was the ultimate disgrace. But they were human beings after all. I remember a, uh, one of the kamikaze attack pilots in the, off the battle of, uh, in the Battle of Okinawa. You know, the, their basic strategy was to lure us ashore in Okinawa. They met us manned without opposition. That is contrary to basic military doctrine. But they let us land, and then the, their idea was to come in with their kamikaze attack suicide attack planes and, um, and destroy the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Um, troop ships. 
and supply ships that were uh, anchored off Okinawa. We fished one of the pilots off of the, uh, out of the water, the Navy did, and uh, he was brought in for interrogation. Well, it turned out that, you know, the kamikaze pilots were young men, 17, 18, 16, about the same age as the suicide bombers in Israel and Palestine today. This man was in his 30s. They were reaching, must have been reaching the bottom of the barrel. They had reached him, he had been a civilian pilot and he was quickly trained for this suicide mission. But he had a family, a wife and children, according to the interrogation. And he was not about to give up his life for the emperor of Japan. And so he, instead of diving his plane into a Navy ship, he pancaked it alongside the ship, was fished out of the water, and saved his life and provided us with some considerable information on the training of these suicide bombers. As I said, I don't know how many uh, actually decided that they would uh, fight to the bitter end. There were a lot of so-called bonsai attacks in several of the battles of the Pacific where after it became clear that they had no chance of winning, they would gather in one final attack, suicide attack, in an attempt to destroy us. None of those attacks succeeded, of course. And as I said earlier, there were quite a few who were in fact captured and became prisoners of war. I'm sorry, but our, our time is up. And I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking these gentlemen for coming and sharing with us. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.